Hello, and welcome to this Institute of Advanced Legal Studies PhD podcast. My name is Alex Green. I'm an assistant professor at the Faculty of Law of the University of Hong Kong. And our topic today is legal theory and your PhD. So what is legal theory? Broadly speaking, a theory of something is an abstract or general account of that thing. So a legal theory is in some way, shape or form an abstract or general account of law. Now, that's obviously very vague, so I'll try to narrow it down a bit for you. I think there are three categories of work that often overlap that fit within the broad schema of legal theory. First, there's scholarship that reflects on the concept or idea of law, including what constitutes a legal system, what distinguishes legal argument from other forms of reasoning, what legal obligations are, what distinguishes rules from principles, and so on. Second, there's work that produces general or abstract arguments about law related to, for instance, its social context, its moral merits, or its political nature. These tend to either critique or justify law from the outside, rather than attempting to provide an internal account of a particular legal concept or the idea of law itself. Finally, and this is, I think, by far the broadest category, there's scholarship that draws upon the analytical tools found in other disciplines, such as philosophy, economics, political science or sociology. So if that's what legal theory is, how might you use it? Well, the first thing you could do is directly make general or abstract claims in relation to law as a complex social phenomenon. This we might call doing theory. Another way to think about this is writing theory yourself, making a direct contribution, for instance, to legal philosophy or law and economics. The second way you might use legal theory is to provide a lens or a analytical device through which particular facts can be viewed, characterized or illuminated. So we could call this using theory. For instance, let's say that you wanted to do a doctrinal review of a particular area of law and you wanted to come at it from a theoretical perspective. You might use theory in this way. Alternatively, you might look at a collection of empirical data undertaken by somebody else and you might characterize that data in terms of a particular established tradition of legal thought in order to shed some light hitherto undiscovered by academia. Third, and this is something any thesis will need to do, you might use theory to detail a methodological standpoint, the factual assumptions that you're making, or a normative framework that forms the premise of the work. Now this I might call situating with theory. It's not doing theory and it's not explicitly using it. It's just showing the audience that you're aware of the existence of these abstract positions and how they might relate to what you're writing about. So now we have that rough sketch. Let's try to put a little bit of meat on the bones. I'm going to talk now about varieties of legal theory. This isn't intended to be an exhaustive list just an indicative taster menu, if you like, of the different sorts of scholarship out there that you might want to draw upon when writing your PhD. The first group is, I think, probably what most of us have in mind when we talk about legal theory in the traditional sense, and that's what's called analytical legal philosophy. This school of thought or tradition of writing tends to draw from the analytical tradition within Western philosophy and is mostly concerned with questions such as what is law, what is a legal system, what makes a legal norm a valid part of a legal system, and so on. You'll find this sort of work in the writings of people such as H.L.A. Hart, Ronald Dawkin, or Hans Kelsen. The second variety is what's now called normative legal philosophy. This isn't so much an attempt to pin down particular concepts involved in the study or practice of law as it is an exercise in examining law's normative or moral foundations. Typical questions here include, do we have a duty to obey the law? What is the value of the rule of law and what does that value entail in terms of how we ought to organise our societies? And what makes legislation worthy of respect? Perhaps it's democracy, perhaps it's the avoidance of conflict and so on. 
Some of those philosophers who do analytical legal philosophy also produce normative work. Ronald Dawkin is particularly famous here, as is Jeremy Waldron. You'll also find a great deal of political philosophers get involved in what is broadly normative legal philosophy, such as Alan Buchanan. The final group I want to talk about on this slide is critical theory. Now, unlike the first two groups, which have a tradition grounded mainly in Western analytical philosophy, whether it is conceptual or normative, critical theory draws more from continental traditions, from literary criticism, and so on. These tend to be left-leaning theories, by and large, although not always. They look at law in its context and ask questions like, what is the relationship between law and power? Is law a product of patriarchy? And can the law racialize us? And if so, how does it do it? Critical theory is a very broad church. I think possibly the broadest of the three groups I've discussed on this slide and include things like feminist legal theory, critical race theory, queer theory, and so on. The next school or tradition that merits consideration is socio-legal theory. This is another very broad church and is notoriously difficult to define, mainly because it draws from various disciplines itself, such as social theory in the continental tradition and sociology in the Anglo-American tradition. It asks questions about the broader context of law, such as what are the relationships between law and culture? How should regulation be understood in a social context? What is the legal subject and what does law assume about them? And so on. Next up is law and economics, which is thankfully somewhat easier to define. Essentially, work contributes to this genre if it uses economic analysis to illuminate our understanding of law. Richard Posner is the most famous law and economics scholar and is uh, in many ways the grandfather of the discipline. Most work at some stage refers back to him. Questions involve, can the content of the law be explained in economic terms? Is economically efficient law morally or politically legitimate? And how can the law adapt to serve evolving markets? Finally, and I emphasize again that this is not meant to be an exhaustive list by any means, there's law and literature. So this is a somewhat amorphous discipline and ranges from the use of literary techniques to interpret the law to comparisons between law and literature as forms of expression. So typical questions here might include, is legal interpretation like literary interpretation? How is law portrayed in literature and how is literature regulated by law? As this range of different schools show, legal theory is an extremely broad category of scholarship. And whilst some of these various approaches might be totally beside the point as far as your own thesis is concerned, some of them will be very much on point in terms of the substantive and methodological points you hope to raise. So now we understand what legal theory is and how we might use it in general terms and have a few examples of the different kinds of legal theory available out there. How do we fit legal theory into a PhD? Well, there are some pitfalls here, and I think you need to be absolutely clear about what it is you're doing when you use theory within your doctoral thesis. Firstly, are you advancing a theoretical argument itself? Are you doing theory? Secondly, are you using theory to provide a lens or analytical framework to examine something else? Or are you just situating your arguments against the broader theoretical backdrop? When considering these points, it's important to make sure that your arguments come across as rigorous and grounded rather than simply nominal and cursory. It's useful to ask yourself, have you taken account of the relevant theoretical literature? What assumptions have you made in setting out your project that might be theoretically controversial? And do you have appropriate training or educational experience of other kinds when it comes to undertaking the sort of theory that you're using? So, for instance, if you're doing a bit of law and economics as part of your thesis, 
have you actually had any training in economic analysis or are you winging it? Not to say that winging it is impossible. Personally, I write a lot of legal philosophy and have never actually done a formal philosophy degree. But it's important when you're embarking on a project, the size and complexity of a PhD, that you take a realistic view of the kinds of research you can get done, how they're going to fit in, and precisely how you're going to use them. Okay, so now we understand how we might use legal theory within a PhD thesis, let's exemplify the point. When I wrote my PhD, not so long ago now, I decided to do it on the law that governs the creation of states. So this is part of public international law. What principles determine when a state will arise, what restrictions are placed on the emergence of new states and so on. Now there's already a lot of doctrinal legal scholarship on this point, but I decided to put a different spin on it. And to do that, I drew upon the resources of analytical philosophy and normative philosophy. I argued that this area of public international law is unified by a common concern. So all the various principles that place limits on the emergence of states and that create conditions that an entity has to fulfill before it can gain statehood all have this one thing in common. They are aimed at recognizing the existence of genuine political communities. But this means if we want to understand public international law and how it deals with emerging statehood, we need to understand what genuine political communities are. This is why we need to do political philosophy. Now, this thesis, of course, was eventually passed and my doctorate was awarded. But one of the things I found most challenging when I was doing this work was explaining in a way that made sense to doctrinal lawyers why they had to have resort to normative philosophical arguments at some stage. Why, my second supervisor kept asking me, can't I just look at the content of doctrinal law? There's surely enough positive law to go around. My particular answer there was twofold. Whether or not it's convincing, I leave up to you. The first part of the answer was, well, a lot of international law on this point is quite unclear and possibly indeterminate. The philosophical arguments I'm providing give the law more content, more depth, and that will allow for more determinate outcomes to be given in particular cases. So for instance, is Palestine a state or not? The second reason is that we would hope public international law would be justifiable, morally speaking. The argument that I gave in my thesis was designed to show that it was, at least provisionally. And you see, it's points like these, justifications that motivate your use of legal theory, that you need to think about if you're going to employ it in a similar way to the way I did. Now, admittedly, this thesis involved two things. Firstly, making an original advance in political philosophy that turned on my idea of what a political community was, and also using theory in that second way I described to illuminate something else, in this case, the content of PIL. Your thesis might not do this, but as my experience shows, you need to be prepared for all sorts of challenges and you need to be prepared to back up your theoretical and methodological choices with an argument about why those choices were made. OK. So by now you should have some idea of where legal theory fits into your PhD. Maybe you're doing theory, maybe you're using theory, or maybe you're just providing a broader theoretical backdrop to a more discrete project. Whatever the case, you're going to need to do some theoretical research at some point. And there's three potential pitfalls or points to be aware of that I want you to bear in mind when you do so. Firstly, theoretical literature, particularly that written by academic lawyers, is usually interdisciplinary. So in law, we often talk about law and economics, law and literature, law and philosophy, and so on. Work like this that borrows from more than one discipline is usually very good and very interesting, but it also employs terminology from those other disciplines that can be confusing to the lawyer unless we go to the pains of understanding it within its correct disciplinary context. Be careful of assuming that you know what particular terms of art mean and be willing to go to that other discipline in order to discover their meaning in context. This brings me to my second point, which is 
particularly if you're doing or using theory, at some point you'll probably have to do some reading outside academic legal scholarship. This might be pure economics, pure philosophy, it might be literary criticism, or it might be critical social theory. The point is, is that you have to understand this literature within the context it is engaging, and not just assume that because it touches on law, for instance, these academics from another field are going to understand as much about law as you do. Use caution, in other words. Be critical, be reflective, and try to put everything in its appropriate place. The final point is a more of an internal one, which is this. When you read any piece of theoretical literature, be it an article or a monograph or whatever, bear in mind that the author will be writing, nine times out of ten, with a particular tradition or school of thought as the background to their own work. Let me give you an example. So within analytical legal philosophy, particularly within that branch that deals with authority as a concept, there is a particular school of thought that's been developed by Joseph Raz that a lot of people subscribe to. However, Raz's concept of authority is radically different from, say, Ronald Dawkins' concept, to the extent that he has one. You have to prepare yourself and caution yourself against reading in your own assumptions about authority to accounts like this, because you will risk misconstruing and misunderstanding the point that the author is trying to make. Again, my advice here would be to take a step back, reflect upon the broader context, make sure you do the spade work and search through those footnotes, and be prepared to be critical whilst reading the work you're reading as generously as possible. Okay, unfortunately, that was the easy bit. Now you have to write some theory, and this, in my experience, is the most taxing part of the entire enterprise. It's very hard for me to set out in abstract terms how this ought to be done, because so much turns on the particular sorts of theory you're using and the particular uses you're putting it to. So let me give you just three general pointers which I think will help you, no matter what sort of project you're engaging in. First. Bear in mind that when you're doing interdisciplinary work, and particularly when you're doing theoretical work, the sorts of arguments that work in legal scholarship will not usually work in that additional field. The classic example is an argument from authority. If we're making a doctrinal legal point, we can, usually at least, point to some statute, precedent, or something of the sort, as the source and basis of our argument that, say, the law is this way rather than that way. This is called an argument from authority, and law is a weird discipline in that in almost every other discipline I'm aware of, arguments from authority are considered to be a logical fallacy. We should provide reasons for our position, not simply cite some earlier point at which they were adopted by somebody else. You need another kind of justification when you do theory. You need to think about reasons, whether they are justificatory reasons, explanatory reasons, or something of that sort. This is easier said than done and requires you to give yourself space for reflection on the nature of your project, what you hope to accomplish by it, and what its merits are. This brings me to my second point. It's really important when writing theory to know your audience. I have struggled with this so much in my own work. If you're writing theory for lawyers, do not assume that they will know why your position matters, or even in broader philosophical and theoretical terms, what you're saying. You need to always bring things back to the legal or practical point, the bottom line, if you like. Why does this theoretical perspective matter? Why am I spending words on articulating it? Signposting is important. Miniature conclusions are important. Summaries are important. Really drive your theoretical points home and don't leave anybody guessing about what work they're doing in your thesis and why. Finally, and this is probably the most important piece of advice I can give you, is that writing good theory particularly if you're making original theoretical contributions, 
takes a considerable amount of time. You need to budget this when you plan your thesis research and writing time. You need to give yourself space to reflect. You don't want to be rushing through your theoretical sections at the last minute. That way, disaster lies. Let's summarize what this presentation has gone over. First, theory is a very broad category. Please don't get put off just because some of it seems abstract or esoteric. You may have read Hart and Dorkin during your undergraduate and think, oh goodness, there's absolutely no way that I can do theory. This stuff is so boring. Don't worry, there's almost certainly something out there that speaks to your research. And it is almost certainly going to be interesting for you to read. So I hope you have fun with it. Even if you don't have fun with it, and this is the second point, remember that your PhD is ultimately a test. And part of what you're being tested about is your ability to grapple with the most complex arguments relative to the topic of your research, which will often include theoretical points. Methodological, for instance, if you're undertaking empirical research. More philosophical or normative if you're arguing more abstract points. Third, reading and writing theory can be very different from reading and writing doctrinal law. Remember that you have to be critical and reflective when you engage with theory. It's not just a question of citing from appropriate authority. Finally, and I think this is probably the most important point I can make, and it needs to be emphasized again, good theoretical arguments take a long time to create and a long time to write, particularly if you're making original points. So make sure you give yourself enough time to understand and deal with this material, because I certainly find it the most challenging part of the stuff that I write, and I think you probably will too. Well, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast, and that theory is a little clearer to you now than it was previously, and that some of the schools of thought and potential questions you might ask yourself have been demystified. Remember that writing a PhD is a process, and advancing a theoretical argument is doubly so. Be kind to yourself, take sufficient breaks, and try to remember that we're all doing this because we have a passion for the arguments that we're creating.